right, Derek Klassen's here. He works for the 33rd team and Bleacher Report. He ranks quarterbacks for a living. What a year for this, Derek Klassen. Um, I'm, I'm a, the quarterback's position has never been more interesting. I got a bunch of emails this week asking if the Bills should trade Josh Allen for both Bears picks or Drake May or whatever it is. Just generally, just sum up what this year has been for the quarterback position. I know that's a huge question. But like when you think quarterbacks in 2023, you think what, Derek? Uh, I think a lot of bad ones like like I get to <laughs> so I rank of every week right and, and the way we do it is I rank all 32 who is going to be the projected starters for that week every week I get to like 17 and I'm like Derek Carr and then you get past that it's like who cares <laughs> like all of these guys right. you're getting into like the the Jordan Loves and the Sam Howells and it's yeah. like these guys are okay but I would have thought we would have had a little bit more coming into the season. And then on top of that, I mean, even a lot of the top guys are not playing as well as you thought. So it's just of all the years for me to start ranking quarterbacks. <laughs> Careful on Sam Howell slander. I came out against Sam Howell as a long-term solution a couple of weeks ago. And I, I, I heard from some people they're in, they're all in on Sam Howell in the DMV. I mean, they probably should be because he's played them out of a top pick anyway. <laughs> and he's, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, Let's. I, I know this is a this is a hard question to answer, but I've gotten some people asking me on shows or whatever, like why are there so many bad quarterbacks? And I think there, you can kind of like Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell this and come up with a couple of different theories. I tend to think it's just bad luck. I think if there's anything, I think you probably could make a case that the sort of the lack of effort into developing backup quarterbacks can come up to bite franchises sometimes but even if you develop a backup quarterback the best you're going to do is flip him for a third round pick now um it'd be really hard to get like a, a matt castle situation from a couple of years ago where you lose a guy he, he plays for full season he plays great you trade him for a first round pick it doesn't happen very often um so i don't think the nfl is amazing at developing young quarterbacks but i guess the question is why are there so many bad quarterbacks this year i mean i think it's like eight different things i mean one i mean you get to the yeah. point of like the practice time since the 2011 CBA, I think kind of goes into your point of like, yes. it's just harder to get these guys. Re I mean, there's only so many reps that go around in practice. And if there's only so many reps, you're giving them to the guy who's going to play. Um, and, and so yeah. that I think is one of the big factors. Another thing is, I mean, a lot of the top guys that had been there six or so years ago, just aren't playing anymore. Like a, a lot of guys that were veteran staples, like Drew Brees, Peyton Manning, um, Tom Brady just left. Like Aaron Rodgers is not uh, obviously playing this year. Um, you just have a lot of guys who were very what, what, what happened? <laughs> well, he played for about three plays, well, and then <laughs> he's coming back. Yeah, he said he's coming back. It's just a little. It's a small injury. We'll, we'll see if Zach Wilson so can keep him short -term in, in the playoff hunt. <laughs> Um, so I, I think you have all that. And then I think the last thing too, that kind of goes underrated when you talk about this, a lot of guys, especially in the last, I would say seven, eight years, these guys just aren't playing as much in college generally, because I think, especially yes. when you go back like 20 years ago, a lot of guys that were coming out were like guys that got to their senior year. They had played a very long time. You weren't getting as much of these one and dones, maybe two years and done, uh, under class type of deal. Now, almost every guy that comes out and is going to be a top first round pick is going to be a guy who played one or two years is a redshirt sophomore or a junior and that's that so you're just getting a lot of guys who come in right away don't have as many reps and if you don't have like the perfect life support system for them it can fall apart very very fast forgive me for not knowing the exact number because i'm a bad host but bill parcells used to have his commandments of taking quarterbacks and it was some he he said he should have thrown blank uh, amount of passes in college and it was some absurd number that nobody reaches anymore like Jordan Travis of Florida State because he's in his 11th year uh, and he transferred from Louisville somebody told me the other day that Emory Williams the starter at Miami was in middle school when Jordan Travis first played against Miami as a Florida State quarterback and by the way he didn't even start at, at, at Florida State he started at Louisville um, but like it, it, there's a few and far between most NFL type of guys are two and three years. So the Bill Parcells commandment, if he needs to throw whatever it is, 800 times, no longer applicable. You just can't see it. Um, and then I'd say like, we were spoiled by that golden generation of quarterbacks. I call them the forever quarterbacks where, and they were perfect because they came into the league in, O two. I mean, in Brady's case, obviously 2000, but like 02, 03, 04, 05, 
they get all of the old school training camps. So they're getting two a days when they're young and they're getting all of these reps when they're fresh enough to do it. They're not getting tired. Then midway through their career, everything changes and they don't get hit anymore. And so they got to play until they were 40. So they got the old school football education that never happens anymore. And then in the back half of their career, they were put in bubble wrap. Like that was a moment in time. First of all, they all made like $400 million. But, and two of them, by the way, run this, run this company that this podcast is on. Um, but like they had not only great talent, but, but great timing. I never even put two and two together there. That, 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 that generation of quarterback got to do all of the trading and, and old stuff and get a bunch more reps and all that stuff. And then also kind of walk into the longevity of, you know, not being hit as much. I, I actually, I never... It, it sounds so obvious now that you say it, but I hadn't put two and two together. And so you get that on top of, I mean, guys that were just genuinely Hall of Fame talents, like like Philip Rivers, uh, Ben Roethlisberger. Um, I mean, all the other guys we mentioned, like Manning, Brady, Breeze, all that sort of stuff. I mean, you add that on top of, like you said, the longevity thing. And now they're just, I mean, they're just too old to play at this point. So like you said, you get all of those guys who are these forever quarterbacks. I mean, forever doesn't actually last forever. And, and we're kind of there at the point where those guys are just gone. All right, we're going to do surprising quarterbacks. We're going to do four and we're going to do two in each direction as someone who watches it every single week. And it's funny because I think narrative and how they perform throw to throw have never been more disconnected. I'll give you a great example. Josh Allen throwing interceptions all over the place. I think people have now confused that stat. It's been going around now about how he's been, he, he's led the NFL in interceptions since 2018, since 2019, since 2020. There's now, I think I've, I've seen sort of some bottom feeders suggest that that means that he's led the NFL in interceptions every single year. He's actually never led the NFL in interceptions. This is the first time he's ever done it. Um, and his EPA per play is up on a bunch of years. So like on a per pass basis, it's a little bit different. I saw a stat the other day, not to throw this, uh, not to just throw you know, gasoline in the fire here. Packers EPA per play is up from last year. Just take that, take that as you, as you may. Um, but uh, you know, there's just, it, it, the narrative has become disconnected for a lot of these guys. Um, we will start here. Your most surprising quarterback in a good direction, Derek Lassing is who? I mean, I, I think I got to start with CJ Stroud. Like it, it's surprising in that he's just in that he's a rookie. Like my assessment of, of CJ Stroud coming out of college, the way that he's playing right now, I thought he could get there by like year three, if everything really turned out for him, um, you know, he got all the, you know, right coaching, right staff, all that sort of stuff. I thought maybe by year three, he'd get there because you think about the, like, he is showing a lot of creativity now, but in college, that wasn't necessarily something he did all the time, except towards the end of right. his final season. And so that to me was like, it might take a little bit of time for him to like fully bloom in that aspect in the NFL. And then you also just think about the guys who come from this offense, typically, it takes them a little bit of time to onboard into the NFL if they ever really get there at all. I mean, I think we've seen all the other past Ohio state quarterbacks are still kind of slow on the trigger in the way that they play. Um, and we're from the moment they got into the league and have been since then um, that just, all of that was not the case with Stroud. That dude came in and he's literally playing as fast as any quarterback in the league. Um, like when they run quick game, he, he's on it. Like literally as soon as his back foot hits, He's like bringing his arm up to yeah. throw. It's it's unbelievable timing. It's the stuff you saw from Brady, from Breeze, from like yep. Pete Aaron Rodgers. Like he's doing all of that stuff. And then, dude, he's just letting it rip down the field more than I've ever seen like a rookie quarterback. Like we've seen rookie quarterbacks throw down the field a lot in a different way. Like Andrew Luck did this and Josh Allen did this where they're just like, screw it. James Winston. Yeah, James, James Winston. Winston like they're just chucking <laughs> it. But it's not like as calculated and like within the rhythm of of – of you know what they should be doing it's just like this is how i play yeah. so i'm gonna do it with stroud it's just like these perfectly calculated shots down the field throwing deep corners into the honey hole cover two throwing post routes um you know throwing seam routes that are contested like he's just i compared him i i when i when he came out of college i said he could be dak prescott if everything turns out right he's he's dak prescott right now and we're 10 games in whoa wow so there's a couple things about it number one i did my monologue on this on sunday night we didn't see Mahomes as a rookie, so no. we have no data point. And I've talked to people about this in Kansas City, and they basically said, listen, it would have been an exaggerated in both, both ways version of what he was in his second year. He would have made a lot more mistakes, but he was also like, you think he takes chances now. You should have seen him <laughs> practice his rookie year when he was just testing his limits and trying to figure out what was going on. So it would have been a wild version of him in either direction. And I think that because of that, 
I think that we think that he was some finished product when he got in the field um, his rookie year, his second year, and that just wasn't the case. When I went through in my head trying to find a more impressive rookie than C.J. Stroud, I was really, really struggling. Because if you look at yards per attempt uh, for rookies who started at least eight games, it's Ben Roethlisberger, who came into a finished product in Pittsburgh, um, didn't even know if he was going to play his rookie year, ended up obviously, I uh, believe, going 15-1 and one that year. Um, Dak Prescott, who inherited a team that was built for Tony Romo. Um, it wasn't a, a roster like Houston. It wasn't a first-year coach. And it wasn't a guy who was airing out passes like this. He's driving the ball down the field in a league where you're supposed to baby rookie quarterbacks until you get until the coach and everybody gets another extension. Like that's literally the operating procedure now is let's just not know about our rookie quarterbacks. So that way we, we can, we can buy ourselves more time. I feel like that is the status quo in a lot of buildings. Um, this feels to me like the most impressive rookie quarterback I've seen. I mean, I, again, I hesitate to say ever, but uh, who have I seen better 10, 10 games into their career? I mean, it's the volume, right? Because if you look at efficiency, there are a couple other guys who are like in that tier. Like you mentioned, like Dak Prescott was an incredibly efficient rookie quarterback, but like the team was kind of built for him to really just be a yeah. really good caretaker. And he was that like the only like to me, it's that the, the team is so clearly running through Stroud and they're putting the weight of the world yeah. on his shoulders, which is just not something you ever see with rookie quarterbacks. The only two. And no, no number one receiver. No number right. One and one no receiver. true, like, like this guy you guys. can just feed. Him. Like Nico Collins is good, but he's not. It, it's not like he has A.J. Brown or something like that. And like to me, the only other rookie seasons that really come to mind in the sense where like they got a ton of volume and they were clearly the driving force for the team being very, very good are like rookie Andrew Luck and rookie Cam Newton. And those guys were not quite as efficient, but I mean, Luck dragged a team that was absolutely horrendous in, in the post Peyton Manning era. Like I think to the playoffs immediately, like that was, he did a lot as a rookie. And then Cam it's obviously very different from Stroud because he wasn't throwing as much, but Cam did feel like, a force like you, you saw him play and you were like oh this guy is a lot different than other rookie quarterbacks but I mean Stroud is right up there with any of those guys and like I said the the, the volume of passing that he's doing it at as aggressive as he's doing it they're just yeah there's not many rookies ever that have done something like this I would also say, and nobody's a bigger Cam Newton fan than I am, except maybe like Stephen Ruiz, but from a non-Panther, non-Auburn department, I'm a huge Cam Newton fan. But part of his success, especially in the first month of his career, was that there'd never been a player like him. So linebackers right. were just like, what do I do? And so that <laughs> opened up so many passing lanes, that kind of stuff. CJ Stroud is just driving the ball down the field. Like defenses should know how to defend that, and they can't because he's throwing these balls perfectly. And so that's that's a difference in, in, in my mind. Um, all right, we'll move on. Number one, let's actually go number two, most disappointing quarterback, surprisingly. Number two, most disappointing. Um, I'm trying to think of like how I want to frame who is who's the most disappointing. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go with I'll go with um, I'll go with this one, um, even though he's the worst player of the two I'm going to mention. Mac Jones, like I thought oh it was going to be better. Um, and the thing is, I didn't think Mac Jones was going to be great this year. I thought his rookie year was kind of overrated. Like people, I think, were too easy to to crown this guy who. I mean, he's like a really good caretaker and he plays well within the system and he's really accurate, but he did never looked like a guy who had like the physical tools to be a top 10 perennial quarterback and all that stuff. But then obviously 2022 happens. He gets stuck with Matt Patricia and Joe Judge calling plays. And I think anyone with with half a brain could look at that situation and be like, that's just not a good spot for any second year quarterback. Really, probably most veteran quarterbacks, I think, would not have fared well right. in the situation that they had. And so I thought with Bill O'Brien coming into the uh, into the fold this year. I thought they were going to be a little bit cleaner in terms of pass protection. I thought they were going to have some better answers versus the blitz. And I thought the overall function of the offense was going to be better. I thought Mac Jones was going to look a little bit more confident. I thought he was going to bring back some of the consistency he had as a rookie. That just hasn't happened. And I don't even think it's necessarily because the Bill O'Brien stuff hasn't come true. I think it's just, you look at this roster and it's like, where's the speed? Where is the the margin for error, there's none of it. Like all they can do is run a lot of these really short routes with guys who can't really separate and don't have all that much yards after create yards after catch type of stuff. So you end up in a spot where the offense can't create any explosives through scheme or with yards after the catch. And then you have a quarterback who Mac Jones is a really good caretaker, but he doesn't have any of the tools to go create outside the pocket. 
just like jam stuff into a keyhole um, to, to make these tight throws fit. So it just like the whole operation just never ended up working. Whereas I thought he could get back to rookie year Mac and he's just not been that. So I agree. I thought it would be better than it was last year. I didn't think the bottom was going to fall out. The question is, if you're a, a talent evaluator, is Mac Jones broken? Like, would you take a flyer on Mac Jones? I mean, I would, I would want him in the building. Like, it wouldn't be like I would take him next year and immediately insert him as my starter. It would be like you, you have him on the, on the, the roster as a backup and see what happens. But like, I think he is kind of broken in the sense of like, you look at what he was doing his rookie year and you could tell he was playing on time so consistently. He was incredibly accurate. He was very, very willing to make tough throws, especially over the middle of the field, especially when they did um, a lot of their play action RPO type stuff. Like he, he can be an aggressive passer. You look at what has happened, especially starting last year and then going into this year, it just feels like he has no faith in the offensive line around him. And I think that's exacerbated an issue he's always had in that he's kind of a guy who fades away from pressure a little bit. He doesn't really want to step up in the pocket and, and do all that type of stuff. But as a rookie, because the offense was working, he kind of did it enough that it, it all made the offense work together. The past two years with how bad the pass protection plans have been and how bad the offensive line has been, I feel like that's all fallen away. And it's kind of had this ripple effect into the rest of his game where his footwork is getting a little bit like quicker and more disjointed because he's just trying to get the ball out and he doesn't want to get hit. Um, and I think that's leading to accuracy issues, some of his decision making. So I, I think he's a little bit broken and it's it's probably a case where it's going to take a little bit of of care with the right coaching staff to get him back to where he needs to be. Tickets to the game, merch, meals at iconic restaurants, stays at Caesars Palace. All this can be yours when you bet with Caesars Sportsbook. Win or lose, every bet earns reward credits, which you can redeem across the empire. Now, if you haven't started yet, use the code Omaha Full and then place your first bet up to $1,250. If you win, great, you keep those winnings. But if you lose, you get your stake back as a bonus bet. All right, so I'm Caleb Williams, and I'm looking at the top of the draft here. And you have Chicago, you have the Giants, you have New England. I believe Arizona is still picking second, according to the NFL. I think people thought that that win knocked them out, and the NFL says it didn't. They're still picking two. But where would I want to go if I'm Caleb Williams? Because I'm looking at this New England thing, and I'm saying, do I really want to go into the – even though it would be sacrilegious to say that before this year – or for two years ago, certainly. I, I, I don't want any part of Bill Belichick with a young quarterback. I don't think I do. And by the way, all these situations are bad. All these yeah. situations are bad. Like you want to go for the damn, you want to play for the damn bears. Yeah. They treat young quarterbacks. Well, so I guess, the, so, so if, if I'm Caleb Williams and I'm looking at this, the top of this draft, I want to go where Derek Klassen. I mean, it would be Arizona, but the more I look at what Arizona's got going on, I don't think they're going to yeah. take a quarterback. I think Kyler Murray, if he could yeah. play like the way he played this past weekend, they're just going to they're going to roll with him. They're going to take Marvin Harrison and be and be real happy. I mean, I think of this group, like, oh my god, it feels weird to say that the Bears might be the best oh, here, but no. like, but the, but well, the Bears, but also the Bears are going to be able to you're going to be able to pair him. With another yes. high skill guy or a, or a tackle, so, so that's, you either get a Brock Bowers or you get the or get a Joe Alt or the young man from Penn State, something like that. So that's part of it. I think the other part of it is the Giants' offensive line is horrid bad. Like they are really, really, really terrible. I think that would be a really yeah. bad spot for Caleb Williams in particular. And then I think that's kind of true of New England too. Like their offensive line is really, really not good. And I think when you pair that with their skill position group where they have no speed. And I think Caleb Williams is going to be a guy because he's so creative and does so much down the field outside the pocket. You need somebody who can like help him create. They have none of that. At least the bears have DJ Moore, man. At least Darnell Wright looks like a good right tackle. At least they can get another guy in the building. So it's still, it feels really weird to say that the bears would be the best spot. But I mean, when you're comparing them to these other options, that's kind of where I feel. The league is cooked. It's a very <laughs> option. Um, all right. Uh, night number two, surprisingly good quarterback. It's it's going to sound weird because the numbers have not been there, but Matthew Stafford, I I, I did not Ooh. think he was going to have all this in him. Like, obviously, we. So here's I think what happened, and this happened. This was my experience with Matthew Stafford last year. Obviously, he has. I think it was the opener against the Bills. 
where he just doesn't yeah he just doesn't look the same it looks like his arm has a little right. bit less in in the tank than it used to he just kind of didn't look comfortable didn't look great the offensive line was a nightmare and he and, and, and the, literally the discourse after that game was well Stafford's cooked but at least yes. they won the Super Bowl so it's fine they gave him a bunch of money they pay, pay for past performance but this whole thing is cooked yes exactly and then like they kept losing games and so by like week seven yeah. everyone including myself was like I'm checked out not watching the Rams don't need to do that when I went back and charted him over the summer because I charted what like, are you an LA resident not watching the Rams? <laughs> I, and I went back and charted him and I was like wait a minute he's still kind of like he's still kind of good he's still kind of got it it's just the offense was so bad I think this offseason they got healthier on the offensive line and that it, it's still not good but it got better and I think that has helped a little bit yeah. and then obviously Puka Nakua coming into the building was kind of an unforeseen you know, little little boost to the offense. And then I think Tutu Atwell kind of took a step forward. So all these things kind of came together to not make the Rams offense good around him, but get it to a level where it could be functional. And then Stafford just kind of unleashes and, and does the rest to elevate everybody. I mean, some of the throws that he makes past 10 yards, it, it's literally like him, Allen, and Mahomes. And, and they're the only ones doing it. Like he still has that kind of arm talent, that kind of touch, that kind of aggression aggression might even be a generous word for it i think sometimes yeah. it's just borderline reckless but when you have the arm to get away with it you do it and then really i think in terms of like guys who can create within the pocket whether that's changing arm angles making sudden little movements knowing exactly what they can get away with in terms of space there really aren't guys that are better than stafford like he makes that offensive line work so much better than it should so he's just a guy who the fact that the Ram, that the fact that we're even talking about the Rams offense in any capacity this year speaks yeah. to, to to the level that Stafford is playing at. Like he's just he's making them so so much better than they should be. So cap wise, he's obviously coming back next season. The eighty six million dollars in dead cap. The year after is thirty seven million, and I, I'm of the belief usually that especially with these dead cap numbers. Like I think the Falcons took like a $43 million cap hit with Matt Ryan when he retired. I forget they'd have to get, give him a post to Sean uh, belly flop contract when they, when they, they had to do a make good there. Um, and so, and then they had to trade him. Um, but I, I guess the, the like, so the, he's under contract basically from 2024 to 2025, unless they want to take a huge dead cap charge. I think kind of think that he's going to be the best option for that. Like this is this team is probably as long as the health persists, which again is always a question with Matthew Stafford. Um, the Rams are kind of going to be fine through the rest of this contract with him. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It's really just health. I mean, that was kind of the concern coming into this yeah. year. It's like, ah, he didn't look very healthy last year. Can he? Can he maintain it? And I think he. I mean, obviously, he's been out the past couple of weeks with a thumb thing, but that's not as it's not like he tore his ACL or something. So, I do think if he can stay healthy. He still has enough. I, I think. I, th I think he still has most of his arm strength. So it's not like he's going to suddenly hit the wall next year. I don't think. Like with Matt Ryan, you could see the arm strength kind of falling off, and then it obviously hit that point in in Indianapolis where it just completely snapped. I don't think we're close to there with Stafford. So he still has, I think, probably at least the remainder of this contract with his arm. So it really just comes down to like how many games can you get him on the field? If I were the Rams, I would still think about taking a quarterback, not in the first round, obviously, but maybe at some point in day two and just just to have the guy there and, and you know Stafford is going to miss games inevitably so you can get this guy some reps but I think for the remainder of the contract he, he's he's going to be their best option to be the guy because he's still to me playing at a top 10 quarterback level all right drum roll please your most surprisingly disappointing quarterback of 2023 so far I want to be very clear that this is not his fault and it's really not him being disappointing oh. it's the team it's Trevor Lawrence and the Jaguars. Like this offense is not what it was supposed to be. Um, and it feels like I'm kind of beating a dead horse because a lot of other people have, have said something similar to this, but I think a lot of it just comes down to the play calling. Um, obviously Doug Peterson kind of took his hands, took his hands off the wheel and, and, and gave things over to press Taylor. And I think we saw last year when Doug was calling the offense, they were awesome. I, I mean, they were hitting all the right buttons. They were doing all the right things. Um, it seemed like they really understood how to get the most out of their personnel, whether that be really spamming Evan Ingram on a lot of the underneath, like yak type routes, getting Christian Kirk moving down the field, um, you know, obviously from the slot, even getting run out of like Jamal Agnew, which was crazy, which they don't need to be doing anymore, which is part of the problem. Um, they're giving, they're, I think they're giving him a, a too many touches, um, but they even got like Zay Jones kind of working last year. It seemed like they really knew what the offense was supposed to be and they found good ways to get shot plays. 
that's just not been the case this year. Like I think the offensive line has gotten a lot worse. Um, obviously, Juwan Taylor leaves, and that and that's been a problem. But the interior is just not good at all right now. And I think it, it's kind of I think the biggest issue with the offensive line is. Trevor can make an okay offensive line look fantastic because he's one of the best guys in the league to me at preempting pressure and understanding how to move around it when it does get there. But they're like a bottom six offensive line right now. And at a certain point, he can't really overcome that. And I think that's really, really given the offense a lot of issues. So they, to me, just feel like an offense that's gotten really constipated really fast in a way that's just, it's not going to work out for them. I think they're in a tough spot. In a vacuum, what is Trevor Lawrence need from a scheme standpoint? I mean, they need to be able to to throw down the field more. The problem is just like, like I mentioned, they can't really do that because really for two reasons. One, the offensive line. I mean, it's just so bad. Like you can't even do it from the sense of like, just get into drop back and, and throw down the field and let him do all the stuff that he wants to do because the offensive line can't hold up. But it's even hard for them to get into the like, run run play action style because the offensive line can't run the ball either like they're not very good at that they're not efficient and they're not explosive so they kind of end up in this spot where it's really hard for them to protect and unleash the ball down the field no matter what they do and then I think the other issue is like Calvin Ridley they brought him in to be an X and I think he can be and I think at times he was in Atlanta he's just not really fully that guy right now I think you see especially against press he's had really terrible really terrible production. I, I don't remember exactly what the stat is, but I know like uh, according to next gen stats, he's one of the he- most heavily pressed guys in the league and he's really not good when he does get pressed. So yeah. I think from a schematic standpoint, I would like to see them get him moving, get him in some, some bunches, some stacks, stuff like that. The issue is just like, who else do you play outside if you're doing stuff like that with him? Cause I mean, at that point you're left with like Jamal Agnew or you're putting Christian Kirk out outside, which you don't want to do either because he's obviously more good from the slot. So I think they're just in a really weird spot from a personnel standpoint that that kind of just leaves them in a tough spot overall. Quickly, salvageable? Easily salvageable? Uh, The thing I will say is (laughs) if Doug Peterson can take a little bit more control, I think it could be salvageable. And I think, you know, we, we even saw this last year where the more the Jaguars played, it seemed like the more they figured themselves out and they really hit a stride over the second half of the season. Maybe that can happen again, but I, you wouldn't be able to, to guess it or project it based off of the things that they've done to this point this year. All right, Derek Klassen, thank you so much, buddy. Read him at 33rd team and Bleacher Report. This time, Jets fans will not come after you like they did when you were on my show last fall for daring to say Zach Wilson was bad. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I took the win on that one, so pretty, pretty yeah, low hanging. You sure did. All right, see you, buddy. See you.